So welcome everyone. We have a very uh, crowded virtual floor today. This is a seminar um, I organized with my colleague uh, Katerina Paoli, who is currently in Sydney where it's 4 a.m. So well done Katerina, I'm in Berlin and I am Alberica Bazzoni, I'm a researcher at the ICI Berlin Institute for Cultural Inquiry. And this event uh, was initially supposed to be a um, larger conference, a two-day conference uh, with many interventions. And then due obviously to the pandemic and restrictions, we decided to have mercy on the audience and restrict it to a more feasible, but hopefully uh, no less uh, intense and engaging event. Um, the, before starting, I would have uh, say a couple of technical things. So uh, make sure that your microphone is muted uh, throughout the session. We will have two talks by um, Claudia Pazos Alonso and Tiziana De Rogatis, about 40 minutes each, and followed by a Q&A session. Uh, during the Q&A, at the end of the talks, you'll be able to ask questions uh, either by raising your digital hands, we now all have digital hands, and you can find the button at the, uh, the bottom of your screen, or you can also uh, type the questions uh, in the chat. Just uh, note that this event is being recorded and will then be posted on the IMLR website. So if you do want to ask your question anonymously and don't want to be recorded, just address it to either Katerina or me in the chat. Um, so we want to start by thanking the Institute for Modern Language Research and the uh, lovely Center for the Study of Contemporary Women's Writing that helped us organize this event. Um, the seminar, the title we gave is Gender and Transnational Reception, uh, Mapping the Translation, Circulation and Recognition of Women's Writing in the 20th and 21st century. And the idea, the frame of the event is really to investigate the intersection of transnational and gender dimensions, both in terms of material culture literary criticism and critical theory. So with a broad um, perspective. The kind of questions that we have asked our speakers to engage with are how processes of literary reception gendered and transnationalized and how do transnational networks support the circulation of texts by women what are the processes that intervene in the recognition or misrecognition of their artistic value in their own country of origin and abroad? And if this, of course, relies or starts from the understanding and the acknowledgement that gender alongside other indexes of social identity plays still, still plays a crucial role in the ways in which a work of art circulates and is received as the construction recognition of artistic value is influenced by social structures and the hierarchies that permeate them. On the other hand, in the past over a hundred years now, networks um, of feminist struggles and feminist thought have, long, have gone a long way in enabling uh, the circulation of works by women and have also um, been nourished by the circulation of, of work by women. So we have tried to keep all these dimensions uh, together. And I will now um, introduce our first speaker, who is Claudia Pazos Alonso, professor of Portuguese and Gender Studies at Wallum College, uh, University of Oxford in the UK. Her research uh, examines Portuguese and Brazilian literature from the 19th century to the present, and 20th century literature from Portuguese-speaking Africa. Her interests include genre and gender, canon formation, women writers and images of women, 
Portuguese modernism and the role of literature in colonial and post-colonial representations of the nations. And today uh, she will be talking to us about the transnational dissemination and reception of Portuguese poetry. And Claudia, I leave, I leave it to you now. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. It's been very stimulating, actually, uh, to be able to uh, think about uh, the women writers I work on from this transnational perspective in ways that I hadn't before. So um, I will uh, use my PowerPoint. Hopefully I'm sharing the screen right now. Yes, but I need to play from the start. OK, I think we're ready to go. So, today I've chosen to talk about uh, poetry, uh, mindful that my colleague is going to cover fiction. At any rate, Portugal has often seen itself as a land of poets, uh, being widely known abroad as the country of two giants from the Western literary canon, Luís de Camões and Fernando Pessoa. Nonetheless, what follows is that Portuguese is underrepresented, and according to the previous uh, survey uh, just, that I've just mentioned, uh, it's actually ranking number 12 in terms of translations into uh, and publications in the UK. If we look at uh, these figures, which I've adapted from Ria Nankin, um, and herself, and she herself took them from the Institute Camões website, they relate to five years ago, 2016. I dare say things have marginally improved in the last five years, and I will say a little bit about why later in the talk. Uh, but we can see that uh, if we look at uh, column six, the percentage of women translated into English is lower than any other major uh, European language. And in fact, uh, translated into English are far fewer writers of either sex. That's column one. And in, there's only uh, three women that were translated according to this survey. One central issue that's actually not cap captured in these figures is the fact uh, of historical neglect. And here, I think it's worth reminding ourselves that Portugal experienced the longest lasting dictatorship in Europe and that gender difference was enshrined in the law, um, where, uh, which stated that all women uh, were equal before the law and all citizens were equal before the law except for the differences arising from their nature and the good of the family. As a result, in practice, this circumscribed women's freedom and had an impact on uh, mentalities. Women were often less anthologized than their male peers in Portugal itself. And as a result, this conditioned their critical re uh, reception both within and without, and ultimately excluded women from the canon in the first place. The generalized lack of promotion of women's writing by male cultural uh, gatekeepers in Portugal um, had a hugely detrimental effect. And the turning point moment came in 1972 with the publication of New Portuguese Letters by Maria Isabel Barreno, Maria Teresa Huarta, and Maria Velho da Costa, known as the Three Marias, a work that strad a collective work that straddles the creative and the critical. Its censoring and the trial of its three authors on the grounds of obscenity parked a, sparked an international outcry, uniting second wave feminists across the world in a support campaign that, huge, uh, that generated a huge adverse effect for the dictatorship. It became arguably, according to Ana Luiz Amaral, uh, one of the first transnational causes of second wave feminism. And according uh, to Isabelle de Courtivon and Margaret Resnick um, in their uh, annotated bibliography, it was the only female author from Portugal translated into English post Second World War and before 1982. 
which seems to me quite extraordinary, uh, but I don't have any evidence to the contrary. There were works translated from Brazil, half a dozen women, but New Portuguese Letters was the only one that made it into English. Within post-revolutionary Portugal itself, the Three Marias provide a tool to under uh, undermine the authority of the regime and pave the way for a rethinking of the nation from a gendered perspective. The knock-on effect after the return to democracy in 74 was a boom in the visibility of women's, of women's fiction, perhaps best encapsulated by the case of Lydia Jorge who has now subsequently made it uh, into uh, translation in English, thanks to uh, Margaret Jewel Costa in uh, the UK. She was, uh, her novel, Uval de Paixão, was translated as the migrant pa painter of birds. And it followed uh, other commissions, two by the Argentinian, uh, for the Argentinian writer, Luisa Valenzuela, and two for the Catalan writer, Carmen Martin Gaita, all by Harvey. The other works by women uh, in terms of prose fiction translated by Margaret Ju Costa are for the Daedalus, Tulin de Gersan in 2010, and a collective anthology of short stories in 2018. Now, Margaret Ju Costa is an incredibly prolific translator and an instructive comparison would be to uh, look across at what happens to Lydia George. She's had 11 novels translated into French and only two into English. And Margaret Costa has translated 10 works by Esat Queiroz, 12 by the Nobel Prize winner José Sarmago, and nine by the Brazilian Paulo Coelho. So why only one novel by Lydia George, one might ask? And the concern there is, given the market share of fiction, what is this going to uh, say in terms of women's poetry? Well, let's have a look. And I think my point of, concept, uh, of, of comparison here is necessarily not going to be fiction uh, by other women, but in fact, uh, poetry by men. And a good starting point is what we can learn from the trajectory of Fernando Pessoa and his reception. Uh, there's material available eh, online in the um, journal um, Pessoa Plural and also in Portuguese studies concerning the reception in the UK. Um, it started predictably uh, with reception in other Romance languages, French, Italian, Sp Spanish, and it reached the Anglosphere via the US and only then the UK. The pattern of this emanation uh, seems to me uh, fairly consistent uh, for my women writers. It's the same for Pessoa as for the women writers. You start with a smattering of translated um, poems in academic journals, i.e. it's academics who start off, um, uh, who kickstart uh, translations, and then multi-authored anthologies, and finally, consecration through single authored book format. And I should also highlight that typically uh, some of the early translations into English tend to be published in Portugal itself. One uh, important case is the case of his prose writing, uh, his unclassifiable prose writing, the Book of Disquiet, which uh, had two versions in the UK in 1991, one by Richard Zenith and one by the aforementioned Margaret Costa. Both uh, won prizes, won awards for their renditions of Fernando Pessoa. In the case of Margaret Costa, specifically for the book of uh, Disquiet, uh, the Portuguese Translation Prize for Fiction, uh, uh, sorry, the Portuguese Translation Prize. Uh, and in the case of um, uh, Richard Zenith, he was awarded uh, uh, in, 2000, in uh, 1999 um, the Penn Award for Poetry in Translation for his volume, Pessoa and Company Selected Poems. So what I would say at the outset is that the work of trans uh, single translators as champions of a given literature must not be 
underestimated, echoing the words of Richard Mansell in connection with Catalan literature. And in fact, these two uh, um, translators between them uh, over the last uh, 30 or so years have been responsible for the successful dissemination of Portuguese literature uh, in, uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. And they are uh, their literary prestige, which uh, has led uh, to a string of awards in terms of recognition, uh, is important and is going to uh, have ramifications in terms of their ability to translate women as well. So Richard Zenith is primarily known for his translations of Pessoa, but and poetry gen more generally, he's translated Camões as well. Um, uh, Margaret Jill Costa has translated a string of uh, novelists, uh, but also more recently some, uh, uh, some po poetry and specifically uh, poetry by women, as we shall see. Uh, Margaret is an OBE for services to literature in 2014, and Richard Zenith was the recipient of Portugal's uh, uh, Pessoa Prize in 2012. As Nicolau um, uh, highlights in connection with Cavafy, there are rarely second chances for a poet rendered into a major language, and even more so in the case of English. Um, so the consecutive acts of translation suggest not simply the reconfirmation of his value beyond his own culture, but the expression by translators and publishers of needs and desires. Um, now, if that applies to Kabafi, it also applies to Pessoa, and I would argue it also applies uh, to the women writers that we shall be looking at. Before we just talk about translators and publishers, uh, I think that in terms of the um, uh, demand driven, tra driven, uh, driven translation, I would also highlight actually the role of academics, uh, specifically uh, in the UK, because Portuguese is taught from scratch at most in universities. There is a need for translations if we wish to continue to diversify the curriculum. So that's certainly um, one uh, um, driving factor uh, in the first place. And as we shall see uh, later on, uh, the translation of Ana Luisa Amaral in the UK uh, was first with an academic press, uh, the University of, uh, of Liverpool. And indeed, she was published in Hispanic classics, uh, which uh, started life in Oxford. And I think that's important to notice uh, because you wouldn't necessarily expect this to be the case. So let's now look at my uh, three case studies. And I will start off uh, with Florabella Spanka. Uh, I appreciate that many of you won't have heard of any of my women poets, uh, but let me sort of uh, hook you on Florabella by saying that her first translator was a, an Italian uh, professor, Guido Battelli. Uh, he discovered in inverted commas her poetry while he was in Portugal. So she was first uh, translated into Italian. Uh, in her own lifetime, which in uh, Portugal in the 1920s uh, was a major coup. Uh, so, uh, Florbella Spranka uh, uh, is uh, uh, the stuff of legend because uh, of the irresistible combination of a turbulent biography and a string of signature poems that alternate between feelings of crushing failure and a proclamation of her lust for life. She was in the process of proofreading her third collection, Sherneke in Flor, uh, when she took her own life and uh, committed suicide by overdosing. After her untimely demise, Sherneke in Flor was published a couple of months later in early 1931 and released to critical acclaim. Not unlike the troubled Sylvia Plath, her suicide fueled a myth. Her reputation rests on a single volume compilation, Sunetus Completus, uh, which was edited by uh, Guido Batelli. 
Now, in terms of uh, his uh, understanding of Florabella, he places her at the end of a long tale of neo romantic poets. He was much older than she was and uh, sees her um, from a 19th century perspective. Now this has had uh, an important um, uh, knock-on effects because uh, Flor Bella uh, has not until recently been seen for what she also is, which is uh, a modernist. She is a contemporary of Fernando Pessoa. Like Cavafy, uh, her uh, uh, um, complete works are actually a very small uh, number of canonical poems in the connection in the collection Sonnets Completus. We're talking of less than 150 sonnets. I believe that the corpus uh, for Cavafy is about 150. Uh, so I guess that ought to make the job of the translators easier. But in fact, uh, it was not until after the revolution. Uh, that the time was ripe for her to be recovered. Because of uh, the neglect uh, to which women writers were subjected during the dictatorship, um, we have got to uh, wait uh, uh, until uh, much more, uh, until after the revolution. What I've got here out of sync is a um, slide which shows that she is actually a myth because uh, artistic responses have spilt into different art forms, such as the cinema, such as music, and indeed responses from other poets as well. And uh, more, most recently, we've got a, a successfully commercially released film, Flora Bella, directed by Vicente de Waal. Her father, Flora Bella's father, was an amateur photograph, and this accounts for the number of photos I've been able to show you in this presentation already. So let's look at her uh, dissemination. Uh, other than one-off translations uh, by Guido Bartelli, um, we have to wait until the republication of the Obrish Completage in the 1980s. And as we can see, there's a direct correlation, there's a wave of translations. Uh, Spain, Germany, France, Italy again, Czechoslovakia is it, um, uh, in those days, uh, Romanian, Polish, and then finally, so much later, English, three years ago. The other aspect of transnational um, travels is actually editions in Brazil itself, and this happened in 1996. I would like to say I could have a whole paper on the transnational circulation uh, across the Portuguese speaking world, um, but that would be a different paper. Now, in the same way that uh, there's an interesting uh, 1991 was a nice year for Fernando Pessoa uh, with two publications of uh, the book of this quiet. Uh, the early 90s were a nice moment for uh, Flor Bella, a watershed moment with the publication of three academic articles uh, in uh, the US and they were reviewed in the year's work in modern languages studies. Um, the reviewer says, Florbella has inevitably become the poetess of choice of feminist critics as they emerge on the Portuguese scene. And he seems really rather put off by that fact. Um, the dismissive poetess, I think, says it all. And he does go on uh, to talk about the articles, which are actually excellent articles. Um, indeed, uh, feminist critics, uh, feminist scholars were emerging on the Portuguese scene and I'm proud to be one of them. Um, translations into English, however, uh, would take a, lot, a, a while longer. So to look at the trajectory in, in the English, uh, in the Anglosphere for Flora Bella, starts off with scattered poems, then moves to collective anthologies. The first one published in Portugal in 97, uh, the pretext was the third European Congress of Feminist Research held in Coimbra. And then we've got this wonderful uh, um, uh, attempt, which is 52 euros, giving equal weight to men and women poets. I rather like that. Uh, then a bilingual anthology by Richard Zenith. 
and uh, the Poets of Lisbon project, uh, which is actually an interesting dissemination. It's a, a very recent um, press, a small independent press, uh, which is um, staking uh, its efforts on commercializing via uh, um, dissemination in airports and other tourist uh, outlets. Uh, so it's interesting that they've published uh, Florbella alongside the canonical, from the point of view of a foreign speaker, uh, Luís de Camões, Fernando Pessoa, um, Sari Verde and Mário de Sá Carneiro. The book format, as I previously said, had to wait uh, in, uh, um, uh, for a US um, um, publication uh, three years ago. Uh, Billy Masunas, incidentally, uh, was one of the authors of one of the three articles uh, that were so negatively reviewed. So I'm glad she's persisted and translated. I would also say that the story of her engagement with Florbella is interesting uh, because it occurred when she was in Portugal and she heard uh, a fado song which had lyrics from a poem by Florabella. So how uh, um, people come across Florabella is not even necessarily uh, through her work, but through her image. She is a cult poet. Now, in terms of the, um, uh, uh, the idea of being a cult poet, my second uh, and, and these are the, uh, um, the first translation actually in English was uh, in port uh, for music purposes was done by Anna Luiz Amaral, the third poet I shall uh, talk about. Very briefly, I want to talk about a second poet before moving on to Anna Luiz Amaral. Um, but I would also like to sort of uh, uh, look at the reviews for Masunas, um, which basically tell us, and the highlighted bits show us, that uh, she is, um, Florbella is placed in the context of world literature and things that say something to an American audience. Song of the Self, Emily Dickinson of Hamburg, Kavafi, Fado Songs, Hamburg Dickinson, Juana uh, Inés de la Cruz. I don't see the humble myself. I think the link is actually with Verlaine, but you, I just want to make the point about the world literature. And I don't see very much about Emily Dickinson either, um, but the connection uh, with Emily Dickinson is actually via Anouise Amaral, who did in fact translate uh, Emily Dickinson into Portuguese and uh, whose own poetry is heavily influenced uh, by her. So it's interesting how these things circulate and the assumptions that critics make. Moving on to my second case study, Sofia de Melbrainer Anderson. Again, uh, she's a cult writer, and unlike Florbella Spanka, she became a cult writer in her own time. This is just as on the left hand side a small selection of the prizes she was given. Um, and uh, her she had a very long career, uh, straddling 30 years either side of the um, April 74 revolution. The image you see there is a film, a docu-film uh, made in 1969 by uh, uh, Jean-César Uh So you can see uh, that uh, by the um, late 1960s, she had uh, become, um, recognized in her own country as a major poet. And my contention following the critic Anna, um, Anna Klobuska is that this is in no so small measure because her poetry was regarded as universal, i.e. genderless. She was also an important figure because of her dissidence. Uh, her, she became increasingly vocal in speaking up against the regime um, in the 1962 uh, collection of poetry Livro Seisto, in the uh, same year the collection Contos Exemplares, and in 1970 in an anthology of poems of resistance, Gradus, Prison Bars. Her, her own husband had been uh, imprisoned by Peter. Like Sorbella, 
uh, she migrated to, to other art forms. I've already mentioned cinema. And uh, transant transatlantically, uh, after her death, um, the, the, the Brazilian singer Maria Bethania has a, um, a, an album called uh, The Sea of Sofia, Mar de Sofia. This accounts for the fact that the translation into English is rather higher up the table than we might otherwise imagine. Um, so uh, we've got French, Italian, then English, and then various other languages. And um, one of the people responsible for her dissemination into English was Richard Zenith. It so happened that uh, he was a neighbor of hers in Lisbon. Uh, but also, if we look at the 1972 um, uh, collective anthology, Modern Poetry in Translation, edited by Elder Macedo, himself a poet, Elder Macedo was an anti-regime uh, poet, so it's not surprising that he picked up on uh, Sofia because of the notoriety uh, that she had in her own home country. Uh, so that explains her early consecration uh, in English. Poetry, uh, if uh, um, poets seldom have second chances in English, then uh, Sophia has had more than most. As you can see, uh, she has been translated into English and published in four continents, in uh, the US, in Europe, in uh, New Zealand, and uh, in um, Hong Kong. This has also prompted her publication, um, uh, the publication of her prose more recently. So it's still an ongoing phenomenon. Both Jules Costa and Zenith have translated um, Sophia, and uh, Jules Costa is the most notable translator of the third poet I would like to talk about today, Anna Luisa Amaral, who is the only one of the three poets um, that is still alive. She too has received a string of uh, prizes. Basically in the last 14 years, hardly a year has gone by without her being awarded a prize. So I've just listed the three most important ones. Uh, she's been therefore um, recognized in uh, Italy, in Spain and nationally uh, by the Pre Premio Virgilio Ferreira, which is very important. She has a string of collections to her name. I'll just mention the first ones, uh, uh, um, Minha Senhora de Que, and the latest, 2019, Agora. And I quote from the blurb, um, Margaret Jules Costa's own words. Anna Luisa's poems are resolutely female, but she casts her net very wide in terms of subject matter. She is a writer immersed in her own culture, but steeped too in, uh, the poet uh, in other poetry, such as Emily Dickinson of Sh or Shakespeare. She has translated the poetry of both, and in the world of the Bible and the Greek myths. The result is a poetry that takes uh, equally uh, the physical and the metaphysical. I couldn't put it better myself, uh, which is why I've quoted uh, Margaret Jules Costa, uh, but uh, just to give you an idea of Anna Luisa's um, credentials, um, part of the reason uh, why uh, I think um, she, she has been uh, widely translated and made it into English quite early in her lifetime, is that she has had, um, um, uh, that poetry has become, uh, uh, started off as a second act. Her day job was as an academic, a professor of uh, Anglo-American studies at the University of Porto. She took early retirement in order to devote herself to, uh, full to, uh, full to, to writing. And as an academic, her research fields continue to be fem feminist and queer studies. 
She currently co-hosts a program on national radio, uh, a, a program on poetry, O Som Que Os Versos Fazem Ao Abrir, and it's publicly available. Uh, uh, so I suggest that for those of you who speak Portuguese, please do listen to it. She's a towering uh, intellectual and one of the foremost uh, poets writing today. Um, so um, what I would say is that her poetry, she realizes that poetry can speak to the mind and to the heart and that it can allow for resistance, but also for the enhancement of human strengths, connection and reconnection towards others. And this is so badly needed at the present moment. For her, writing becomes a new form of telling and of retelling and of countertelling. So language empowers and gestures to worlds of possibility. She also questions the space occupied by dominant culture and discourses, and her familiarity with the sweep of the Western canon uh, is visible through her works. So this accounts for the fact that she uh, uh, appeals uh, to both the everyday re reader of poetry and to an academic, a more restricted academic scholarly circle. Let's have a look at her reception. Ten years after the publication of her first collection, she's translated uh, by a fellow academic into French, and then in 2008 into Italian, again by a fellow academic. And then in, uh, and then in Spain, cu in Spanish, curiously, via Latin America, and uh, then uh, in 2015 in English. In book format, I'm pleased to say she was first translated in UK by an academic press um, and re, uh, uh, that collection was republished uh, in the uh, US in 2018 and in 2019 another collection uh, titled What's in a Name was translated uh, and published by New Directions. What is remarkable here is that uh, if we look at uh, uh, other uh, book uh, translations of Florbella and Sofia, they have often uh, received state sponsorship. Um, Ana Luisa Amaral hasn't. We can see from the titles that she positions herself uh, with uh, titles that will echo in the English speaking world. Uh, in fact, What's in a Name was an anthology that was published of Portuguese poems that was published with an English poem uh, type, uh, with an English title uh, in the first instance in 2017. Now let's look at the endorsements um, for The Art of Being a Tiger. Tom Stennett uh, regrets that uh, it's difficult to translate uh, the uh, discourses, uh, the national discourses against which she pitches herself, and he may well be right. On the other hand, Eleanor Jones uh, highlights that the volume speaks clearly to the moment we find ourselves in today, so that even the poems um, Europe, which actually are in intertextual dialogue with Fernando Pessoa, will resonate with the audience today, even if they don't know Fernando Pessoa. Finally, Hilary Owen stresses Amaral's feminist poetics, which opened a way for a, a, a collective solidarity for women. And she, um, she talks about uh, one of uh, Amaral's signature poems, Common Places. Uh, it takes place uh, when she, uh, Amaral is in a greasy spoon cafe um, and there's only one woman amongst the school of men. A few endorsements uh, for the uh, What's in a Name, published in the US. Amaral's subtle experimentation makes strange the repertoire we thought we knew. I'm not going to have time to read these all, uh, all of these, so I'll leave you. But I, uh, I noticed that uh, the, the publishers chose to highlight the source, but not the name, except in one case, which is the last but one. Uh, so what Rachel Blois-Duplessis said uh, is attributed to her.
And that's important because she is uh, a towering figure uh, in uh, feminist scholarship. So brilliant is the word that recurs. Translations into English. As a 21st century poet, we must uh, take into account Anneliese Amaral's dissemination in websites and specifically in Poetry International. Um, but more recently in uh, Asymptoti, uh, which uh, collaborates uh, with The Guardian and explains why uh, her signature poem, Testament, was showcased by The Guardian on International Women's Day 2017. Um, I will come back to that particular poem, probably her most famous, uh, at the end of my talk. Anna Luisa Amaral is very much a living author. She has done recent tours, and here the Institut Camões had the good sense to support them. She has done festivals as well, and uh, numerous live readings. I'm just singling out the one in China. Um, and also, she has a web presence. And a web presence, I think, is the hallmark of a, 20, a 21st century uh, author. And here I uh, quote um, Suzanne Boxcourt, performative acts in press interventions, i.e. interviews, for instance, social media, blogs, websites. And these are transnational, the building of a transnational public self. The digital media also enables a wider pool of cultural commentators, be it via Facebook, and I leave here one particularly nice one in Portuguese, or more recently via the Women in Translation um, site. And I, uh, very interesting uh, to look at the various tiles and the various likes that she receives. So conclusions. We have come a long way in the last 50 years since uh, New Portuguese Letters made it as the only uh, work translated from uh, Portuguese into English by women. All my three poets have had more uh, second chances than most, and in the case of Sofia in her lifetime, and ditto for Ana Luisa Amaral, but there's still a, a way to go for her, I believe. Uh, more recently, the, the growing film of, uh, field of transnational, uh, um, uh, sorry, of feminist translational, feminist translation studies is making us aware of the need to translate more women. And uh, the women in translation uh, is a case in point, uh, the prize hosted by the University of Warwick, another one. And this is very badly needed because if we look at statistics, women typically start their a transnational life by anthologies where they're poorly represented and the internet hasn't improved matters, certainly for Portuguese women. If we look at the bottom, uh, the Poetry International website only has 15% of Portuguese women. So, a to-do list. We can't change the past, but we can influence the transmission of the past and we can help to shape the future. Uh, uh, preparing this talk has made me think that actually the next uh, thing is to have um, uh, uh, an anthology, a collective anthology of women in translation. Perhaps uh, it could be titled Sonnets from the Portuguese. Um, uh, that would uh, echo in the English-speaking world. More importantly, for Ana Luisa Amaral, uh, who is uh, of the three, the one who's alive today, I suggest that the way forward for her is the translation of individual collections, such as Shkuru, an extraordinary collection, or her latest, Agura, which actually engages, uh, amongst other things, with rewritings of biblical stories. That has got, surely, a universal resonance today. And I leave you with the translation by Margaret Jo Costa of the poem Testament. I will not read it out. Thank you. Are you not reading us the poem, Claudia? 
I don't think I have time. Maybe I'll read just one tiny. I'll read, I'll, I'll read the second uh, 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 and 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 uh, fifth sentence. If I should die, I want my daughter always to remember me, for someone to sing to her, even if they can't hold a tune, to offer her pure dreams rather than a fixed timetable or a well-made bed. Let my daughter remember me and later on say to her own daughter that I flew off into the sky and I was all dazzle and contentment to see that in the house none of the sums added up and that the potatoes were still in their sacks, forgotten entire. Thank you. And very nice to end uh, on a poem. Um, actually, I was seeing it there, I think it should be a little bit. Um, no, really, thank you for this incredibly generous and uh, rich multi-leveled um, discussion that took us through a long time span and many issues, many data and interpretations and talking about multimedia transposition of texts, uh, demand-driven translation, uh, through academia and really like this uh, double trajectory of a transnational uh, within the same language and across languages uh, of poetry. And actually, thank you also for talking to us about uh, poets uh, in the first place, which, as you uh, stated from the beginning, is in itself something that is not um, very common and certainly not common enough. Uh, there will be time for um, more questions and a response uh, later. For those of us who perhaps um, joined a little bit later, we are going to have a second talk now by uh, Tiziana De Rogatis, and then we will have a Q&A session uh, at the end. So I'm now going to introduce uh, Tiziana. Uh, Tiziana De Rogatis is Associate Professor of Italian Literature at the Università per Stranieri di Siena, University for Foreigners in Siena in Italy. And her research interests uh, focus on female identity in relation to contemporary literary forms, myths and rituals. And she has worked extensively on contemporary women writers, Italian, European, North American. And she is now one of the world's leading experts on the work of um, Elena Ferrante. And among her many publications, I will just uh, mention uh, this, the one on Elena Ferrante, published both in English and Italian, um, Elena Ferrante's keywords. And after poetry, she will talk to us about uh, fiction and narrative, again, with three uh, authors. Uh, the title of her intervention is Transnational Storytelling and the Global Novel, Elena Ferrante, Cimamanda Gozzi Adici, and Margaret Atwood. So thank you very much, Tiziana, for being with us, and um, I leave it to you. Thank you, Alberica, and I would like to thank Alberica uh, Bazzoni and Caterina Paoli for their strenuous organization <laughs> of this seminar and the uh, Institute of Modern Languages and the Center for Contemporary Women Writing in London for patronizing this, uh, managing and patronizing this, this uh, seminar. Uh, I will share the screen with you. Is it working? No. Berica? Yes, it's working. Yeah. Ah. But uh, yes, I should. Uh, I can't find the presentation. We can also see it like that. It's, okay. It's, okay. So. It's fine, yeah. uh, let's start. My my speech will be divided into four points. The first one is transnationalism and gender in the contemporary historical political context. The second uh, is uh, the presentation of the three women writers and the three novels which uh, we will be working on. My friend cycle by 
Italian, Elena Ferrante, Americana by Nigerian Chimamanda Ngozi Adisha, and The Handmaid's Tale by Canadian Margaret Hatwood. The third point is uh, uh, the connection um, between transnationalism and gender at point one uh, in the perspective of these three women writers and mostly in the perspective of their posture. They posture their authorial stance in relation to feminism in relation to their transnational reception in relation to their national canon. Um, the fourth point, the last point, uh, is uh, again transnationalism and gender, uh, but united now with another perspective that is storytelling and the global novel and the three women writers. This is the fourth point, is uh, much a hope. I don't know if I will arrive until that, but it's a very important point because the po is, this is the poetic area of these three uh, women writers and the idea. The idea is to find a connection between transnationalism and gender uh, research and perspectives and the global novel area. That actually, they are very united and related, and to find um, this connection uh, throughout four sub points. The first one is very important, and is uh, the connection between storytelling languages and the educational system that these three women writers are sharing in different plots, in different strategic devices. Uh, then another connection and another shared uh, strat uh, devices in this three women writers in these three novels is the multiple located and embodied female identities, um, the multiple temporal layers, uh, and at the end, the storytelling as a careful dosage of opacity and readability. Uh, let's start with the first point. It's um, transnational and gender. What is transnationalism and gender? What does it mean in this contemporary historical political context? We can imagine trans nationalism as um, an energy, a movement that radiates within and beyond the borders of the nations. And transnational can, transnationalism can, can be conceived as a geographic, cognitive, stylistic network, as a position of discontinuity, border or margin, or margin inside and outside nations and between nations. Um, according to Stephen Bertovec, uh, transnationalism refers to the multiple ties and interaction, interactions linking people or institution across across the borders of nation state. And uh, according to Charles Bardet, Loredana Polezzi, Barbara Spadaro, uh, transnational and translational approach refuse the container model of, na of national cultures and stresses processes of communication within and across political boundaries. Uh, Transnationalism is a very demanding perspective, I must say, after this, all my work <laughs> is really demanding because subverts dualism and hierarchy between disciplines. So you, if you want to work on a transnational perspective, you have to deal in the simultaneously on a sociological level, on an anthropological level, um, on, the, on a poetic uh, on a cognitive level. So you have to uh, deal with the, with different disciplines and you have to renounce uh, to the hierarchy between these disciplines for, because sometimes some topics from uh, far distant disciplines for you are much more important to focus the question. And, and then transnational subverts dualism and hierarchy between center and periphery, high culture and low culture, subject and object and object. That transnational from this perspective is uh, structurally uh, against false universalism, of course, but that is very interesting is also against extreme relativism and identity essentialism. That means that translation is something like um, negotiation between borders, also between um, identitarian borders. And it's very interesting and very important in this uh, 
in this moment, in a moment in which we are discussing uh, about the crisis of multiculturalism in every nation in the world and, and about the importance of, of, fund, of funding um, uh, an area of uh, shared multiculturalism. Uh, transnationalism is uh, because of this medium posture uh, is uh, the crucial articulation sameness and difference is the difficult work to find uh, where is the connection of sameness and difference of local and global and in the back perspective this is the M emma bond a very important scholar on transnationalism and then ulrich beck a very important scholar on global global research transnationalism is a rooted cosmopolitanism or otherwise a cosmopolitan a cosmopolitan rootedness no? and, we, and then again uh, the connection between local and global between the national root and the transnational perspective uh, let's let's find now uh, the the link with feminism why transnationalism should be so important for feminism. At the end of my talk, I would say, at the end of my research for this talk, I would say, God save transnationalism in the women's perspective, because really you will see how important it is, it has been, and it will be for women writers. Um, why is it important? Because transnational feminism in the, in the work of Eleke Bomer, a very important uh, work, Stories of Women, uh, transnational feminism is a constant, constant negotiation between and across boundaries and between particular and universal in order to address, this is very important, the dissymmetries of power that impact on women's life. But uh, universal, this is the very difficult word as we know after post-colonial studies. And another female scholar, a very important one, Françoise Lyonnais, already in 1995 was, was facing the big question in uh, her work, post-colonial representation, women, literature, and identity. What is the main question we, we have to address right now? Can, can feminist theory articulate a common question for a multicultural practice? Is it possible? This is, this is a, a great question, actually, because, uh, we know that we have now the, the great urgency to uh, create a dialogue between uh, universal urgency, political shared universal urgency, and the feminism of differences and intersections. Why we have why, why we have this urgency? This urgency comes from this, our war against women. This neoliberal time can also be defined as a war against women. And now you, you, you will see this terrifying, um, this terrifying list of, of, of um, um, features from this, this war. Fem feminization of poverty, strengthening of patriarchal laws, procedures and practices in many states of the world. And, and, and one example of this strengthening of patriarchal laws, procedures in many states of the world is in these photos, in this image that was just 20th March 2021 is protests in Istanbul against the Turkish withdrawal from the Istanbul Convention. Uh, it is just the last step of this strengthening. When I'm talking of strengthening of patriarchal laws, procedures in many states of the world, I'm talking uh, of, of states from Western world as well as emergent world, as well as global south. It's, a diversified, this transversal uh, movement of, uh, patriar of patriarchal uh, strengthening, but this is, is, is shared all over the world. It's diverse, but it's shared at the same time. And again, the efforts to implement new anti-abortion laws in many states of the world 
um, increases of worldwide cuts in welfare and family support, support policies, rising rates of femicides um, all over the world. But we have uh, objective statistics from uh, United States, from uh, um, some countries in uh, South America, from some of the former socialist republic in Eastern Europe. Um, the failure of judicial system to defend women and women's rights is me too movement of 2017 that is already um, is still an, an open question as you know uh, and the attack the misogynistic and homophobic attack against the so-called gender ideology this is this is um, the reality we are facing right, right now and this is the back the backdrop that the the, the question is uh, feminism can, can multicultural multiculturalism is possible to uh, unite uh, feminism and multicultural practice with, with an universal question that we are facing right now, that is this war against women. Um, this war, I mean, is, is very connected to a, a, an anthropological um, dynamic that has been studied already a long time ago by Arjuna Padurai in 1996. Already, a Padurai, this anthropology, and this, this, the, the, in this study modernity at large focused on this primordialism that is not a, a primordialism that comes from a, an archaic exotic area of the world but is a primordialism embedded in modernity and is a primordialism that is uh, is based on collective identity based on shared claims to blood soil or language and this is sovereignty this is white suprematism as well as many form of integralism and fundamentalism all over the world um, so this is the first point, the connection between transnationalism and gender. Let's go now to the third, the second point, the three women writers and the three novels, uh, and which kind of criteria, criteria I, I, I'm using to, in order to present these three women writers. The first one is Elena Ferrante with My Brilliant Friend Cycle, otherwise called Neapolitan Quartet, otherwise called Neapolitan Novels, and already you can see see um, the reception from um, readers and critics all over the world. There is a reception very well focused on the Neapolitan scenario of the um, cycle, uh, because Napoli is the main character, we could say, of this of this novel. And we we have a Europe edition. We 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 look at we look at my brilliant friend cycle from the transnational perspective. So the uh, the first uh, transnational uh, edition is the the, the American. One is 2012 uh, Europe editions, New York. Very interesting Europe editions is uh, um, uh, a, a creature, uh, a creature of uh, the Italian AO, which is the uh, Italian uh, Ferrantes Italian Publishing House, who created this this American platform in order to translate all. Uh, uh, their authors and, and most of all Ferrante. And they were uh, quite clever, I would say, in this perspective. And here we can see the four volumes, My Brilliant Friend, 2012, The Story of a New Name, 2015, uh, the, Those Who Live and Those Who Stay, 2014, and The Story of the Lost Child, 2015. So, um, Let's look. This is a brief storyline. Uh, we we have this three storyline of these three novels, and uh, the aim is to find a transnational link also in the storyline. Because uh, what are these storylines sharing? They are sharing um, a, a meditation on the female destiny in modernity. Uh, there is a, um, a way to to intercept. There is a, a, a way to intercept the trauma of our uh, current war against women and these writers. And actually, Elena Ferrante is setting her, her plot uh, between uh, 1950 
and 2010, but uh, and this, so it's a sort of historical novel, a genealogical novel. But this 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 um, this tale, this plot, uh, is actually uh, talking to us, to our current time. Let's see why. Um, the four volumes are talking, are, are narrating the lives and friendship of two uh, friends, Lila and Elena, uh, from their childhood in a poor suburb of Naples to mature age, from 1950 when they are six years old to uh, uh, 2010 when they are, have turned 66. In the wake of great social transformation, which Ellen and Lila are an unaware protagonists, the two friends have teamed up since childhood in order to trespass the real and symbolic spaces in which a millennial female subordination has locked them up. So as you can see, this four volume saga uh, can be uh, summarized in this narrative mechanism. Uh, is a, a, a dynamic of trespassing and punishment. In the very moment the, the two um, girls uh, united and strong because of their controversial friendship, in the very moment they trespass the domestic spaces, they gain um, new, uh, new uh, possibilities, uh, new perspectives on life, but at the same time they have to face the patriarchal violence. This is the dynamic structure of the four volume saga. And that's why this four volume saga is dealing with the trauma of this war against women in our current time. Uh, no, we have, and, but another uh, step of this transnational um, dissemination is um, in uh, 2018, uh, the first release of the TV series My Brilliant Friend, La Mia Amica Geniale, by Saverio Costanzo. This is a HBO production connected with the RAI, the Italian Broadcasting Company, and uh, the screenplay is by is co-authored by Elena Ferrante herself, Saverio Costanzo, Francesco Piccolo, and, uh, um, sorry, another co-author that now I can't remember and I apologize for this, but uh, anyway, Italian as well. So you can feel, you can perceive uh, the, um, the great balance, the global balance, because HBO, of course, is a, gi a giant, and uh, whereas uh, Rai is a very uh, little uh, national structure, the screenplay is Italian, so it's a very local balance. And this is the first HBO production from, uh, not, from not without English original roots. So it's a very important experiment. Um, and let's arrive now to uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adishe, uh, uh, her first date of, uh, of publication is 2013, Afrag Nof, a uh, publishing house based in New York. So a Nigerian writer uh, that is publishing in English, of course, because uh, English is the official uh, language, Nigerian language, together with other many um, Nigerian languages uh, in New York and is already transnational, but is talking also of a, an, a, an Adisha characteristic. Adisha comes from the uh, third generation. This is the, the um, cover of the first edition, 2013. Adisha comes from the third generation. That means um, a, the, the third post-colonial generation that has faced very uh, uh, huge difficulties in the 80s and 90s, um, and a very a, a, a generation that has to face um, a terrible economic and political crisis in um, Nigeria, and that's why um, Adisha decided to leave. Nigeria and to attend university in uh, United States. Mm, the, this is uh, a report from Adish of this very difficult time, but I actually don't have time to read it with, with you. Perhaps we can 
come back later. And again, the storyline from Americana um, is very connected to what I was saying before about Adisha and about her necessity as a third generation facing youth in this difficult time in Nigeria. Uh, because the main character is a Nigerian girl, Ifemelu, and the uh, novel is her uh, Bildungsroman and her sentimental education. The story is set between Nigeria and United States and is stretching from the first half of the 90s until the first election of Barack Obama in 2009. So actually, Ifemelu is, uh, is uh, leaving the same um, the same um, additions trespassing from Nigeria to United States from for the university. And the novel takes place between two Nigerian cities, the Megalopoli Lagos and the university city, city of Tsukka, uh, and several American cities, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, New Haven, up to the austere Princeton. If a male spend, spends 13 years in America, where she decided to emigrate as if a male, as uh, a teacher, in order to attend a non precarious university like the Nigerian one. And like men, any Afropolitans and Nigeropolitans, a very interesting compost, compound words, and like Adisha herself, Ifemelu eventually decides to return to her country of origin and finds new transnational roots in Nigeria in a third space. So this is the, uh, the line and uh, um, the, the, the story here, why, why the, the story, why, why we are sharing the story line where is the connection with um, with Elena Ferrante. Uh, there is a main very important connection that I hope we will focus better after that is the, viol the, the ambivalence of emancipation and violence that is um, uh, generated by the educational systems. Uh, if a male is, uh, the, 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 the novel is the for Bildungsroman, if a male is Bildungsroman, and this Bildungsroman is based on her um, on her experience in the educational system in Nigeria and uh, in the United States. Uh, so again, uh, they, uh, this is a story in which the trespassing uh, women trespassing uh, happen, uh, happens at a great cost, but happens. Uh, and now Margaret Atwood, The Handmaid's Tale, uh, published in 1985 by McClellan Stewart, a Toronto-based uh, publishing house. And this is uh, saying a lot to us because uh, Margaret Atwood is Canadian and uh, um, she's very rooted in the Canadian identity. We will see what, what does it mean, Canadian identity. Um, so the first, the first year of the of the edition, 1985, is very high, as you can see. Why, why I'm not talking of uh, her of Handmaid's Tale before? Why I'm not presenting Handma Handmaid's Tale before Elena Ferrante? Because actually, uh, in some way, it comes after. I mean. Uh, Handmaid's Tale was already very famous when when uh, was published, uh, won the Governor's Award, and uh, the, uh, in uh, 1987 won the Arthur C. Clarke Award, and had uh, a movie, a film version, a choreographic and uh, operistic version. But the turning point for the Handmaid's Tale is this is this um, mini series, TV, TV series uh, by Bruce Miller for a, a Hulu production that comes in 2017. But it's not just this. I mean, this is a turning point because this is the moment Handmaid's Tale became uh, a universal tale on uh, the set uh, of the war against women on the trauma of this primordialism of which we are talking about. But it's not just the, the TV series, it's the intertwining of the TV series with another political event that we can 
that can be summarized by this image. And this, what, what, what is this image? This is uh, ended right now <laughs> because I mean we are out of this nightmare. Uh, but uh, the 23rd January 2017, uh, this was one of the first executive orders by Donald Trump as a president of the United States. Uh, executive orders means that the president, when arrived in the White House, can sign some executive orders without, um, ha without uh, having to expect the... the um, uh, the the consulting of parliament and the first of the executive order was the mexico city police that is uh, a, a series of procedures uh, throughout the president of the united states can uh, diminish can control can uh, um, can um, uh, eliminate um, the most of the funding of the United States for uh, abortion support, for the support of, of uh, the, the right of abortion in the United States and abroad all over the world. And this is not important, just the executive orders, it's the choreographic scene of these executive orders that is saying a lot to us. So is the intertwining of these two events that was arriving to this. That means that uh, The Handmaid's Tale became a code, a code of subversion and survival for women all over the world that were using uh, the storyline of The Handmaid's Tale and the uh, access or the, all, the, all, the, all, the, all the repertoires from The Handmaid's Tale to express their um, uh, protests against the patriarchal strengthening all over the world. And we are here in Washington, of course. And, but why, w what, what, what is talking this storyline that Atwood created in 1985 in Berlin, where is Alberica now, and um, where when uh, the, the wall was still there. And so um, she was very impressed by this um, experience in Berlin and uh, by this, this experience of the repressive system of this, this, this divided city uh, as it was at that time. But she was very impressed also by the um, theocratic uh, Republic of Iran that were taking place in the, uh, 1978. So there were a lot of reasons for, for creating this dystopia that becomes really, really actual and current now in 2017. Um, the storyline, uh, a nuclear war and a consequent ecological catastrophe occurred in a not to distant future result in the collapse of American birth rate and democracy. And this is very interesting, the democracy, <laughs> the connection between birth rates and democracy. Following a coup, the American parliamentary system and its government are overthrown and replaced by Gilead regime, a puritanical and caste-like uh, theocracy inspired by reproductive obsession. The regime reduced all women of childbearing age age, those who were emancipated singles and or mothers and or companions in relationship not sanctioned by marriage into mates. In other words, they are bound to be slaves, solely destined for mounting and procreating. So the figures you have seen right now, the red figures with white handkerchief in the images you have already seen by TV series and by the protests in Washington are the mates. This is the uh, genius um, clothes of um, of the of maids in um, in the Handmaid's Tale. Uh, however, in the novel, all women and not just the maids are forced into case-like roles. The entire female population of Gilead is divided in, into categories such as wives women united in marriage to men belonging to the superior male caste of the commanders. Of course, also the men are divided into caste. Uh, econo wife, women married to lower 
caste men owns working as educators or, or overseers the entire family caste system, a very important figures for the system. Marta, housekeepers and non-women, women who are no longer of childbearing age and are inadequate, uh, uh, inadequate or have, have refused refuse to be owns and so on. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is the same mechanism, even if it's different of uh, my brilliant friend cycle. I mean, this is a dislocation of time. The time is used to, uh, we, this is an allegorical use of time in which the, writer, the woman writer is using another time to talk about our current time. No? In this case, it's a dystopia, it's a projection in a future in a bad future, as the etymological root is saying. Uh, let's go now to the third point, the Ferrante and the Adicious and Upwood posture toward feminist and transnational reception and national canon. And Alberica, how much time do you think I still have? Another 10 minutes. 10 five, minutes. Five, ten, 10 minutes maximum, five to ten. Okay, thank you. Uh, Let's arrive to the posture, God, and making it. Posture is, uh, or authorial stance is a Jerome Mezos definition, is a set of, can be defined as a set of practices which include nonverbal self presentation behavior and discursive, and discursive ethos. So, how these three women writers are expressing their posture? Let's see in uh, towards feminism. Uh, well, I, I like to, to, to associate uh, the guerrilla girl manifesto uh, there was actually the manifesto of this call when was uh, when was thought as, as, a, as a call for for meeting and, and um, I, I, I would like to, to to associate the the anonymity of the guerrilla girls with with the Ferrante's anonymity uh, that is well known Ferrante uh, Elena Ferrante is a pseudonym uh, and um, why because uh, where is the relation? In the fact that guerrilla girls as Ferrante uh, have been using uh, anonymity in order to uh, uh, evaluate and underline the female creativity. Uh, this is the, the manifesto we'll talk together. And uh, in, which, in which way? Because uh, Ferrante's anonymity uh, has uh, given space uh, to other women such as uh, uh, the young women, all the, 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 all the female friends that, are, that were going to buy the Brilliant Friends Cycle together, the many female scholars, uh, many friends of mine with, to whom I'm very grateful, uh, united in their alliance, many women translators all over the world that, that acknowledge that they the, the gain a great uh, visibility uh, because of the partial partial absence of Fer Ferrante. But is it, is it a real partial, total absence? No, because Ferrante is actually very present, as you can see by this, this, mm, this uh, uh, weekly collaboration with Guardian. There was the uh, beginning of incidental location, a, a collection of, of um, short, uh, reflection by, by Ferrante. Ferrante is always very present in the press and is always very, uh, uh, very attentive to feminism. This is a um, statement from her. Mm, I am a passionate reader of feminist thought and I sum up even distant position together. This is very interesting, a, a position of hybridity. Uh, yet I do not consider myself a militant. Mm? Quindi a position like as I am creative, as I'm a, an artist, uh, my, my, my relation to feminism is not 
ideological, but it's creative and can, in, for this reason, can be very hybrid. Uh, and now uh, Adish, Adish's posture towards war feminism passed through uh, two books, We Should All Be Feminist, a manifesto uh, of 2014, and Dear Joelle, a, a feminist manifesto and 15 suggestion. Uh, they are very interesting. And, and uh, We Should All Be Feminist was, um, uh, was uh, disseminated by flawless uh, Beyonce song that was using one of the topic, one, an excerpt from We Should All Be Feminist as the main, uh, the main um, rhythm of the song. Um, it, it, any, again, the glocal, the glocal position of, um, of uh, Adice, because uh, there is in both books this link from Nigeria to United States. The feminism experience is, uh, is uh, uh, built by par narrative parables, very simple stories uh, rooted in Nigeria, in Lagos, in Suka, or in many uh, cities of the United States. And uh, um, a feminist manifesto and 15 suggestion, this, this book, this manifesto for the education of a young a little daughter is also um, an effort to uh, create a global perspective for feminism. So uh, yes, she's she will be an Igbo woman. She must be very proud to be Igbo, but at the same time, Igbo is is one of the uh, of the language, one of the main tribe of uh, Nigeria. But at the same time, you as a mother must learn her to to be selective, to appreciate the good of Igbo culture, but to refuse the patriarchal version of the Igbo culture. So this is very important in the multicultural perspective. What about an um, outward posture towards feminism? Uh, we know that um, um, Atwood started in uh, 1968 uh, uh, with a great feminist overture, The Edible Woman, this novel that was considered a cult book for the, that feminist generation. But at the same time, uh, Atwood uh, has always claimed that she was a precursor of the feminist movement. She was not really into the feminist movement. And he, her position is always quite um, plastic and sometimes uh, um, Polemic, like in this excerpt, excerpt from this uh, this this um, article in the Global Mail, uh, uh, with, with this very significant title, "Am I a bad feminist?" And uh, let's arrive now to the um, uh, Ferrante transnational reception that starts in two uh, after during the publication of My Brilliant Friend Cycle in 2013 with James Wood, Women on the Verge, a very important uh, American critic uh, with this very positive review. Uh, and uh, uh, from this review, uh, from the Euro Europa edition um, publication, started this Ferrante fever, and then the Ferrante effect, the ascendant um, power of women writers in Italy. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we, I, I worked also on the side. For example, this is the side that the uh, Europa edition publishing house was was uh, as created for Elena Ferrante. In the, uh, in the United States. Um, this is uh, uh, the Elena Ferrante's list of 40 women writers published, published on Bookshop. Uh, this is a very transnational list in which you will find as a Ferrante's recommendation also Americana. Um, what about the Ferrante in the national canon? And here we can see a very important Alberica Bazzoni research, uh, a, a little part of a very important Alberica Bazzoni's research uh, in which Alberica is showing us that in the um, Italian university, women writers uh, uh, have this little part in yellow. Uh, and whereas in the British university, uh, women writers have almost half 
of the teaching courses in the in the British university. So there is this uh, uh, embarrassing, this this uh, terrible uh, dissymmetries between Italy and um, and uh, UK. Mm, and this is com this comes from the fact that uh, that Italy has a very uh, patriarchal academic structure, and uh, Ferrante's reception was very controversial. Ferrante's got a great uh, success from the public, but at the same time, a very controversial reception from the academic area. But uh, she got also a very united front of female scholars and some male scholars in Italy uh, that helped to, um, uh, to support her and allow her to be um, isolated from the, um, from the high reception in Italy. And this comes from the, the capacity of these this, uh, scholars in Italy to intercept, to be united with this transnational area. That's why God save transnationalism. Uh, what about... Um, Chimamanda Ngozi Adishe and uh, uh, her position in the national canon, in the national Nigerian canon, is very interesting because um, uh, Adishe uh, is very connected to Chima Chebe, is the most important Nigerian writer and also one of the most important to the African literature. And uh, his Things Fall Apart novel is a masterpiece, a touchstone from African literature and Anglophone literature. Uh, but at the same time, her strategy is very um, plastic, I would say, uh, because at the same time, she... Uh, um, she is able to elude the patriarchal cage of Chino Achebe and Nigerian male tradition, uh, connecting herself to four mothers and sisters um, that, she she, that she was able to find in the Black African tradition, Black women African tradition, and in the Black international tradition. So the particular position of uh, Adisha is that she has a wide range of forefathers, foremothers, and sisters. And uh, let's see now, this is uh, whereas Margaret Atwood's site, uh, whereas this is the official site uh, through, through which you can, you can have an idea of her very important transnational position because you have this impressive list of awards and recognition. Uh, it's very interesting also the biography. Uh, so you, you have an idea of her very rooted presence in the transnational area. Uh, but at the same time, uh, in the national canon, you have this. I mean, Margaret Atwood, uh, She's not a woman writer that has, has to fail to deal with the national canon as Ferrante and as Adisha herself, because she is actually the mother of the Canadian canon. I mean, this uh, amazing woman in the 1972, uh, in, in a period in which Canada was not really, I mean, uh, a very... Uh, a very emancipated nation was still the beginning of the feminist movement. She wrote this them thematic guide, survival, thematic guide to Canadian literature in a moment in which most person in Canada were, uh, were sure that Canadian literature wasn't really existing. It was just a dependence of uh, English, British or American um, literature. So she really is the mother. She is at the very center. She, she, uh, she did, her posture was, is this, I am at the very center. Oh, I'm, I am the mother of Canadian literature. Um, this is my uh, last point, Alberica, vero? <laughs> and um, uh, strange enough, was the, at the beginning was the core of my of my talk. Uh, anyway, uh, justice, storytelling, languages, and educational system. The last point of my of my talk, just this. I want to, I want to say just this. How much storytelling is important, and how much is related to gender 
reception. Uh, you have here three uh, excerpts from the three um, women, women writers. I'm not going to read it, but just there are three uh, statements on storytelling. And the three statements from Ferrante, Adisha, and Atwood are sharing the same idea, the incredible power of storytelling, uh, the necessity to achieve this power for women writers, and the necessity to uh, work on the power of language that is what they were doing in these three novels these three novels are not just masterpiece of storytelling but are also meta narrative uh, works on the power of the single word as you think also i can make just one example nolite te bastardes carborundorum do not let this bastard destroy you the the phrase the formula that offered the protagonist of a handmade's tale will find in a cupboard as um, an heritage from the other uh, maid that was they committed suicide and left her this message, a message of survival and resistance uh, that uh, will be able to destroy all the repressive structure or Gilead. Just one phrase. So my conclusion is not, I mean, it's a little bit eccentric <laughs> is this, this. Yes, the, fa the, the future is, that, is actually this, is a fucking nightmare. I mean, this is the the uh, the gate side the side guess the of uh, a handmade tale but but uh, with this women writers and with storytelling energy of these women writers of our female readers we will, we shall overcome thank you thank you so much Tiziana for this also very um strong ending on the um future as a, as a yeah a fucking future and um i like it that uh, claudia ended on a to-do list and we also and you also ended somehow on a, on a to-do list which we shall overcome um so i am uh, so much to to take in really and i just first of all want to thank you for engaging so deeply really with the major questions that we were asking in this in the seminar about gender and transnationalism and i think that something that really um, emerges clearly from this comparison between three very different but also very related uh, authors is this fracturing and multiplying of identity uh, that seems to key, really play a key, to be a key element in these um, women's transnational novels. Something that is, seems to really define the, the, their transnational uh, effort. And yet these, uh, these storytellers um, widen the horizon and scope of the novel, recuperating modes of the 19th century uh, novel. So the, the pleasure of the storytelling and the richness of the, of the novel shape, really. Uh, but giving up from the beginning the very fantasy of a master subject and a master narrative. And this is no small thing to do. And uh, a fantasy that uh, somehow still haunts modernist and postmodernist. Uh, novelistic forms, at least with its absence or the mourning of that possibility of a master narrative. And, and actually they replace it, uh, this seems to me, with what you define as embodied traumatic impact with, um, with modernity and with primordialism. And I was quite struck in this uh, construction of fragmentation and storytelling by your reference at the beginning to a need for a commonality, uh, a need for uh, a shared ground on a global level for uh, women and for feminism in response to a war on women that happens on a global scale, not on a national scale. And 
uh, I wanted to uh, ask you how do you see the the difference and the similarities in in the different ways in which uh, these three writers situate um, their novels. So the global dimension for uh, Ferrante, the global diasporic, uh, nomadic as well, because it goes back and forth, movement for Adice, and the dystopian, which is a very different temporality again. Uh, how do you see that? How do they, does that work in your view in constructing uh, common grounds and showing fractures? And so this would be one first um, thought about the, the, the storytelling and the building common ground. And then I, before leaving uh, space to Caterina and, and then the audience, I just wanted to mention um, something that I think is uh, very relevant in general to the topic of our seminar um, today. And that really speaks for me to this question of fracturing, multiplying of identity and building common ground, which is the controversy that happened uh, surrounding the case of Amanda Gorman. And I don't know who, how many of you are familiar, so I'll give a very brief summary of what happened. Is this African-American uh, poet, young woman, who read her work, performed her work at the uh, Joe Biden's inauguration. And there was a contra controversy surrounding the translation of her poetry into Dutch and into Catalan. So the um, uh, Dutch translation was assigned to, was given to Marieke Lucas Rimbeld, who is a non-binary uh, young Dutch person, a uh, novelist. And this sparked a huge controversy in that it was called uh, as a sort of a failed chance for giving a voice to Dutch uh, Black translators and authors. So uh, journalist Janice Duell asked, why not choose a writer who is just like a woman, a spoken word artist, young, female, and unapologetically Black? And against this, a columnist, uh, Kenan Malik, on The Guardian replied uh, with a, an article entitled, Lost in Translation, The Dead End of Dividing the World on Identity Lines. So uh, this fracturing of identity uh, is posed as opposite to the possibility of a commonality that would be realized, according to Malik's, in giving the translation to a white uh, non-binary person. And then I, thought, uh, I found other comments surrounding this uh, topic, which we can certainly not have the ambition of solving today, but I thought it was interesting to bring it in, talking about gender translation and reception and common ground for feminist struggles. Um, it's something that Italian-American uh, writer and translator Claudia Grassanti wrote on her Facebook page, uh, countering the notion of uh, difference and identity with that of resonance. And a resonance between the person who translates and the person who is translated, saying that this resonance can be born out of distance as much as from intimacy. And intimacy does not stand for identification in the same body, same gender, same ethnicity or social class, but in something that resonates between two lives. So bringing in the issue of identity, but also trying to uh, not pose it as the final, the final word. And another um, journalist and writer, I think Dutch, writing in the Dutch magazine, Read My World, actually brought in the political aspect of this, saying the reality is that there is a lack of true diversity in the literary translation realm across many Western European languages, such as Dutch, French, English. So when an opportunity arises to publish a work that tackles the Black experience, it is of immense importance to go out and find a translator from the existing pool of talented Black voices within the target language. In a context like this one, ignoring this option is choosing not to care. Literature is political, poetry is political, and so is translation. And so bringing in this, this dimension. And I just, end on here is not a question really, but it is a, an observation that I think is perhaps a provocation for us to think about the challenges of thinking of commonality through translation, through storytelling, 
and the problems that this causes for single access identity uh, or fixed uh, boundaries uh, of identities and yet the importance of obviously not neglecting that entirely. Um, so I leave the space to Caterina and I want to thank you really once again both you Tiziana and Claudia for your uh, wonderful really very very rich uh, speeches and deep engagement with the uh, with these questions. Thank you. Great. So thank you. Thank you both. First of all, both, both talks were absolutely wonderful, enriching. And like, uh, I think personally, I learned a lot. So thank you both. First of all, um, I'm just going to share some some thoughts about Claudia and Claudia's talk and um, um, perhaps like, yeah, just some thoughts that like I had while I was reading her, her talk and like listening to her presentation. Um, I really um, liked um, the fact that she started the talk talking about multiple marginalities and how this multiple marginalities, like which in this case, poetry written by women in a nation that is considered small, have, you know, just open up like a, a huge set of questions and, and problems. And um, and I was wondering if this multiple marginalities could um, could work as a point of strength, uh, um, as in um, if they if if um, if there is if there has been or if there could be. Um, a um, some examples of uh, uh, poetic transnational solidarity just to overcome these multiple marginalities, as in if some fellow poets uh, have helped or could help uh, in uh, kind of overcome this uh, uh, multiple marginalities that uh, Claudia. Um, talked about at the beginning of our talk. So this is like the first thought that I had. I really enjoyed the fact that Claudia mentioned like the historical issue of Portugal and how the dictatorship really um, played a huge role in like holding back the transnational reception of Portuguese literature and in particular of Portuguese um, female poetry. Um, and that is really something that um, is, I, I find really fascinating and always like important to, um, because also Claudia was saying at the end, you know, we cannot change the past, uh, but it's so important to be reminded of what has happened in the past and how we can uh, think about ways in which we think about the past in order just to, of course, shape the future. And like the ideas of, for instance, like, you know, uh, creating, sonnets from Portuguese poetry from the past. I thought it was just like fantastic. Um, so I really, I really enjoyed that, that point. And um, um, another point that really made me think was um, her three case studies, how different they are and how they draw attention to um, different issues, of course, but um, um, you know, she mentioned the network, networks of cultural diplomacies, uh, the need and the desires of publishing houses and academia, and the importance of having recognized translators, uh, um, the translatability of the work, in particular the myth of, of the story in Flor Beller case, how, how that played a huge importance in the reception of, um, of her poetry. And... Um, so this, this three very different case studies, which of course I like bring to the fore three very different identities of these three uh, female writers. And I was wondering, so one is like, you know, our tragic life stories in a sense become her, um, the way like her, her writing is her, her life, which is like per se, just like a thing that, and then the, um, 
Sophia like she instead became a cult in her own life so she didn't have to wait to die in order just to be listened to and uh, Amaral instead a very prominent prominent intellectual figure a well-established academic and so drawing attention to the importance of the network and uh, the importance of having um, a very clear um, and sort of like socially very distinguishable identity in order just to be listened to. And I was wondering um, uh, how much does that impact uh, and inform the reception nationally first and then transnationally? Because some, yeah, I've, I have like this this question of identity and like is particularly important, but like I have like in mind, for instance, like an Italian female poet and translator who, um, her, like I just mentioned because I, I work on her, her name is Giovanna Bemporad, who just struggles so much to be recognized, like her, her story is, um, yeah, it's a bit of like a myth story as well, but she didn't benefit from that. And like, she's also as a, and that it's a bit of an hybrid because she's a poet and translator at the same time. And that seems to be complicating the, the story. So yeah, um, yeah, these are my thoughts. And um, I like, I, I don't know, like if they're, um, if they're any useful, but yeah, uh, yeah, that these are like the, yeah, these are the thoughts that were like inspired by, you know, Claudia's talk and I thought I'd share it with you. So maybe, maybe now if, um, if everyone is okay, we can, we can open the, the floor just to other questions or, or how should we proceed or perhaps like let the speakers respond just to the thoughts that, that we, that we raise and then, yeah, should, should we do that way? Would that be all right? Yeah, I would give the word back to uh, Claudia and Tiziana. And then in the meantime, if anyone has questions, you can uh, raise your digital hand or write your question uh, in the chat. Yeah. So I, I will. Um, it's incredible, uh, Alberica, because at the beginning, my talk would have should have started with Amanda Gorman <laughs> question. No, really, I, I wrote I wrote three pages that there, there were there weren't possibility any possibility. No, there was there was no space for for this. And uh, so I, that that means how important is this Amanda Gorman uh, question? And we we should we should use uh, this. This, this situation that has been creating as a tool to reflect on multiculturalism because my position, I'm afraid, is very, I mean, is very rooted cosmopolitanism. I think, I think uh, they are both right, actually. And we should really think that they are both right. I mean, the um, Dutch black activists, I'm sorry, I, I can't remember now the name because I'm very tired. The, the Dutch black activist that was um, stating that the translator um, should have been uh, a woman, uh, a, a spoken uh, poet, a woman and uh, unapologetically black uh, is right because she's uh, posing the question that black translators all over the world are marginalized. They do not work. They do not work. And Kenan Malik even was recognizing this. And we must think that the hill we, cl we climb is a political poem performed at Joe Biden uh, uh, ceremony as a symbol of Black Lives Matter. So it's not, it's not a, a, a normal translation, it's a political translation. So under this perspective, uh, this is right. At the same time, I must say that I am very worried by the connection between uh, political marginalized dramatic issues like this and uh, um, economic strategies 
economic strategies, like the strategies of this publishing house that have retrieved the um, uh, the. Uh, the, the aim of translating not only to Rinevald, but only to the Catalanian translator who has the guilt to be a man, no? Uh, without explaining this, I mean, there is a connection, um, a, a weaken, that, that, that is weakening the, 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 all this political question. There is a connection between uh, civil rights and some economic strategy by publishing house, let's think just also to the sensitive readers question in the USA, no? You, you cannot write without posing your book on sensitive readers that have to give uh, the permission. Or all the, uh, all the uh, control that bureaucratic structure in the university in the USA are posing on the uh, teaching of, of, uh, of the courses. You cannot, you, you are not free in the United States to teach uh, the, uh, controversial, uh, big uh, cult book novel from literary tradition because uh, students had the possibility to uh, put a trigger alarm and the university structure can make hard pressure mostly on teachers that are not uh, in a structured position, a tenured position. And Laura Kipnis, uh, a, a lefty thinker in the United States, has written a book on this, very important. And Margaret Atwood has signed a petition on this. I mean, uh, the question is right, but if it becomes a, a neoliberal, um, a neoliberal strategy to create a taste for everyone, to satisfy a taste of everyone, then Malik is right. I mean, some position of Malik are right because Malik is studying the crisis of multiculturalism in Great Britain from 20, 30 years. And um, uh, government policy of uh, implementation of uh, funding on uh, association uh, that are uh, characterized by their ethnic ethnic roots uh, is actually a way to give importance to religious movement in uh, in Great Britain. That means uh, not the minority, but the part of the minority that can potentially um, exploit another part of the minor minority, the women. So Kanan Malik is right under the perspective, but the Dutch black tactics also is right. And, and, and the question is that we have to speak about this without censorship and auto-censorship. Uh, because we have to rethink uh, all the question, I think. All the question has to be completely rethought. And about modernism and postmodernism, of course, I mean, uh, these this, this, uh, women writers are great, uh, great, uh, um, these novels are great heritage of the modernism and postmodernism tradition, first of all, because they uh, have created the storytelling full of shadow zones. So that means shadow zones created by uh, unreliable narrators. The three novels are narrated but by, by, by by two unreliable narrators in uh, Atwood uh, Handmaid's Tale and in a Ferrante Brilliant Friend Cycle. And Americana uh, is a plot, uh, is in um, um, is, uh, is, is, is a plot in which the, the male, the, the, the main, the, the central situation, the trauma area um, for which Ifemelu uh, decide to change her life, this, this erotic condescence for the white tennis teacher, this objection she felt in the moment she had to prostitute herself and she felt excited by the male tennis teacher because she's because he is white. Hmm? This objection area that is uh, 
uh, that this show to us, the exhibit to us, without explanation, is like a, a, an objective correlative that is creating a shadow area for all the novel. So again, we must really uh, talking about multicultural is not the great ability of uh, Adisha to talk about something really objected about black identity, the fascinating fascination for whiteness the Franz Fanon fascination for whiteness, uh, creating on, on this uh, uh, a whole interior path of Ifemelo. This is incredible. And all in a shadow zone in which you are uh, showing to me as a reader something without explaining me this. And this is the unreliability of these novels and this the great heritage of modernism and postmodernism in some part tradition. Well, I'm not sure <laughs> it can add very much to the debate. Um, uh, I have been thinking about it a lot. Um, and I think this, uh, also in connection of justifying my own talk, because obviously I chose uh, three Portuguese women uh, who are white and uh, I could have broadened a talk to incorporate some poets from Brazil. Uh, and uh, it, it, it was a difficult one. It was a very difficult call uh, for me because I really do believe that um, uh, as academics, we have an ethical responsibility um, to uh, put uh, the, ver the complicated uh, intersections around race uh, firmly on the agenda. So what I would say is that it's still, uh, it's not an either or. Um, and uh, I was also uh, slightly amused to see that I had chosen three writers and so had uh, Tiziana. Uh, so I think it's our subconscious telling us uh, to avoid binary. <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, I think that even within the sort of uh, um, framework, I think to sort of uh, uh, have this sort of magic number three, uh, it changes the conversation. At, um, I mean, in your case, obviously, it was particularly good because it did bring in three continents uh, in a way that mine was so much more uh, localized. Uh, obviously, mine's kind of brought a, a kind of historical dimension. Um, but I really do believe that in a sense, it's, it's, it's not an either or, that it's important to have these conversations um, and uh, uh, and and that takes me to a different point. Uh, so leaving uh, uh, the question uh, 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 of the translation uh, of Amanda Gorman, um, back to Katerina, just very briefly uh, to say that uh, in terms of the, um, you know, how do um, uh, poets uh, from minor locations and Portuguese is in this in-between position of being both major and minor because it's got so many worldwide speakers, but Portugal itself is such a small nation. Um, uh, but how does, uh, you know, if we think of um, Galician or Catalan or any number of other languages within Europe, uh, it, it gives us food for thought. And I think poets, in a sense, uh, do have uh, an opportunity, perhaps even more so than uh, fiction writers, in terms of festivals, in terms of uh, live readings. And I also do think that there is a potential for the internet as a democratizing uh, mechanism. Uh, the example I gave uh, wasn't so for the Portuguese women, but potentially it is in terms of interactions with readers. And also simply because if we think of the poet, the short poetic form, in terms of how it gets transmitted and circulates within the internet, it's so much easier uh, than, uh, you know, a big chunky novel. Um, and again, I don't think it's an either or. Uh, so, 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 so I just think that it's important uh, when we're talking of, of these various modes of translation uh, to keep them uh, going, um, but with a feminist agenda uh, at the heart of our operations. So I think that's all I wanted to say for, 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 for the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for, for the responsive. I'm, on, I'm monitoring the chat uh, to see if there are uh, some questions. 
there are lots of thank yous and lots of um, expressions of gratitude and pleasure. And it seems that people really loved both both talks and learned a lot and enjoyed it. Um, I can't see any question um, at the minute. Like I think some people also had to leave um, after after the the talks, but um, but perhaps we can we can wait a few more minutes and see. If, if there are some, some questions coming up. Yeah, because we are also a little bit over time, so maybe people had to, <laughs> to leave, but um, I think that's fine. Um, but I, uh, waiting for, I didn't, I, I didn't understand your position, Alberica, about Amanda Gorman situation. Because I didn't state it actually, I didn't took position. I asked. Uh, I just put it in there for really question. Because I think um, it is a question uh, more than, sure. and I agree with not uh, polarizing it into, as, as Claudia was saying, into binary answers, yes or no, um, and and in some sense. They're both right in terms that there are issues at stake and it's not one front against another. And this is why I quite like the approach that I mentioned by Durastanti, even though it was just a post on Facebook, so not really didn't have the, the, the necessary space uh, that such a complex issue uh, deserves. But the idea that, you can, that what matters is trying and construct resonances across lives when it's about translating and which means that it is possible to do it uh, across differences but also that those differences matter and so it is a perfectly fine political choice and representational choice and voice choice to choose a black uh, person to do that and if not uh, then I like the, the concept of caring that this other Dutch um, journalist mentions. Then if you don't, you can do it as in you don't care, as in you don't even ask yourself the question, or you can do it in a caring way, in that you propose something different that can create that resonance, but taking into account the choice um, of a white translator, and, and it seems like Gorman had agreed on, um, yeah, yeah. on, on them uh, as, the, as her translator. So, and he stepped back, agreeing to step back. So somehow the two people involved actually got very well the complexity of the situation. As I think I have to say more voices in the debate. Uh, and I mentioned the ones I found reasonable because then there are those who say everybody can translate everyone. Yes, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, and obviously, well, I haven't really read anybody saying that it is a problem in itself for a white person or a male person to translate uh, an, um, so a, a black woman. Um, but maybe pushing the, uh, the political agenda a little bit more. Uh, so I think it is a great occasion. It's, it doesn't happen that often that a translation yeah. is is so scrutinized, so it is also a good occasion, I think, for uh, the enormous amount of work that now is being done in translation studies and feminist studies combined to, to really tackle the issue. This could be a seminar in itself, I think, um, also perhaps with black voices <laughs> speaking, and, and that would also uh, something. Very interesting thing <laughs> is that the, the Dutch black activist was writing her statement in a sort of hybrid Dutch and English. I, I, I read the original. And then a, a Dutch professor, a woman, a female Dutch professor, translated it in English in order to make it universal. So every step of this question comes from the visibility of translations that normally is invisible, no? It's very interesting. I also find it amazing adding to that how nuanced the situations are because, of course, the uh, Dutch writer Marieke Lucas Rindelt is non binary, was chosen by Gorman, and was having a certain approach to the text. And then there was the Catalan uh, translator, uh, Victor Ovios, who, yeah. who was outraged uh, at being criticized yeah. 
office and actually said that he would have had to go blackface to translate <laughs> for him. And they're like, well, in this case, I guess they made a good choice in, in excluding him from the job because clearly you don't have that sensitivity to the issue. So also shows how different possibilities are there. Um, and in one case, he disqualified himself really, and the other case was far more nuanced and complicated. Yeah. Yeah. So there are a couple of questions on, on this issue. Like the first one is from Ana Marquez dos Santos, who asks, Rea Amanda Gorman and the living authors discussed here. Do you know whether the authors had a saying in the choice of translators? Um, yeah. So this is very briefly speaking for myself. Uh, I only have one living author that I discussed, uh, but Annalisa Amaral has had uh, several authors, and I listed them on one of the PowerPoints. Uh, but um, Margaret Shulkosta was a match made in heaven, and indeed, they do collaborate, they are on record in interviews. Um, on both sides, they've said they work with each other. Um, there are emails toing and froing. Uh, Margaret says that sometimes she writes, you know, five, six versions, and that um, these are kind of sent to Anna Luisa, who, who then sort of sends them back with, um, you know, if there's queries with answers, with suggestions. So it is very much a collaborative process, and I think in the best possible way. Um, uh, but perhaps I would say that this is easier to do uh, at a stage in her life where Margaret Shulkosta probably has less financial um, immediate concerns and where uh, Anna Luisa herself uh, is retired from her day job. So I think they can invest uh, in a way that's not tied by mere, uh, you know, by financial considerations, which are usually very real in terms of time pressures. Uh, but perhaps that's also why those translations are so uh, beautiful. So, uh, so yeah, that's my answer. I didn't know about you, Tiziana. Is, is the question involving me as well? Uh, um, yes, I think, because it says, do you know whether the authors had a saying in the choice of translator so the living authors discussed ah, if the, uh, about the artwood um, addition but i can i can talk about ferrante and uh, because this, i mean the 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 most important translation the translation that makes that made makes busy made, made visible the novel all, all over the world and uh, well yes i think i think angostin is the translator of the whole in English of the whole work of Ferrante. And uh, Goldstein has been a long choice. She translated Ferrante before the um, success because um, Europe Edition published before uh, My Brilliant Friend Cycle, Troubling Love, I think, uh, perhaps. Uh, other colleagues, scholar here can help me, Siliana Mikola, for example. I think I think it was Troubling Love, the first Ferrantes novel. And um, so th th there's been a time to know each other before the great success. So it was 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 a long commitment with, with, with Anne Goldstein that became at that point uh, translator of the Ferrantes opera. Okay. Thank you. Um, there is a... Okay. There is a, a question from... Um, reflection from Sandra Foley. He says, I thought what you, Tiziana, said about the non-hierarchy between disciplines was interesting. Does transnational research require a transdisciplinary approach? Can comparative literature be a good starting discipline because it already crosses several disciplinary boundaries? 
Uh, yes, thank you. It's a very good question. Uh, comparative literature is a good step, but um, it's not enough because it's 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 the basic step actually. But it's not it's not enough if you are used to stay in the literature liter in the literary field, if you are used to work on on stylistic poetics question, because transnationalism is really a wide process. I mean, working for this seminar, I, I, I really felt there was, uh, I was uh, under the snow many, many times because you really have to deal uh, for different authors at different levels and you have to intertwine these levels. So you have to use sociological tools, but also you need anthropological tools because if you want to reflect on Amanda, why translation is now so important and why it's connected to transnationalism, you have to use anthropological tools, political tools, you have to read a little bit about multiculturalism. And at the same time, as uh, Claudia showed with her great talk, statistic and, and data and data by publishing houses are very important. No, you 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 need a lot of data, and and then you have to uh, work in order to uh, preserve the the life uh, of of the novels of the poetry. I mean, at, at the end, this is thought in in the dimension that a reader is feeling at the same time all this process when he's reading Ferrante or uh, Florabella Stanza. I mean, he's, he's this, this, the transnational experience is, is an experience in which when you are reading in a very intuitive way, of course, you are feeling, you are experiencing all this connection. You are feeling at the same, you are you are perceiving at the same time a sociological backdrop, a, a, an anthropological scenario, a formal and aesthetic experience. And you as a scholar have to step back and forth <laughs> on all this level, interpreting three authors. Uh, it's, it's very demanding and it's very, it, 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 is, uh, it needs a lot of, you must be very humble. <laughs> in order to do this, because the temptation is I don't want to go out, I want to stay. I mean, in my comparative area that is already a lot, is already wide. I don't want to go in all these methods. And so you need to be very humble for transnationalism. Open, humble must be the same, no? No, I don't know, Claudia, what, 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 if you agree with me or not. I, I, I'm not in a, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> there, there is um, another question that starts again from Amanda's case, but then I think opens up a little bit. Um, it's from Simina Rakitenau. And the question goes, regarding Amanda's case, is there a ban slash requirement for ethnic representation when selling the translation rights to countries in which there are no black or ethnic translators? Does the poetry still benefit if it cannot be translated due to the political issue and the voice choice when no translator is available to translate their work to some language? Question mark. Um, that's a very big question. Um, well, I, I, I don't think there is this um, uh, and requirement. The requirement because otherwise all the process from uh, the publishing house, the, the, the Amanda Gorman team to the publishing house in, uh, uh, in Holland and then in uh, Catalan should have been under this procedure, should have been a sort of procedure that was a path guiding the assignment 
whereas the idea at the beginning was uh, to give to give the, the, the I mean Amanda Amanda Gorman was happy to give to Reinwald the commitment without thinking about the political issues that are actually quite connected to. And when they fired the <laughs> Catalanian translator, there was no reference in the um, in Victor Obbio's um, complaints about this this requirement. So that there is not there is, I, I, th I think there is not. And I think that is uh, the, the issue is really important because it's like a surface of a lake with, with a lot of sunlight. It, it, everything seems very clear, even if you think to opposite point of view, no? Kenan Malik and the Dutch uh, actor. But the problem is that under the surface, there is an underworld of very complex question that need to go in visibility. That is the political question of black translator, but also uh, the, uh, the economical exploitation of political issues by publishing houses, by university bureaucratic structures that, the, that, that are weakening actually uh, all this question, using this question as, as economic uh, tendency and fashions and, uh, and, 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 and strengthening a form of censorship. No? In, for example, we, we really had have a problem in the United States now about the freedom of of of, um, of teaching some novels, some classics. So it's very important for us, uh, well, to think about this. Why, for example, this is a very right question. Why there is not a requirement for some kind of political poetry like uh, the hill we climb is no? Because the hill we climb is is political. Manifesto in some way, no? Yeah, also I think reminds us that translation is such like a complex process, a complex decision, and it is always like political. It is impossible just to detach the decision and like, you know, the, like whatever like one puts into translating out or without, even when like is a silent. Uh, even when the implications are instated or silent, like it's, I think, yeah. So it's Never as you like said, it's, it's incredibly complex and multi-layered, and there are so many dimensions embedded that, like you know, I think it's just now, like, uh, yeah, no translation is transparent. Far from it. Yeah. Uh, very opaque so. process. Yeah. Um. I think we can uh, let our speakers go. I know that Claudia also uh, has to go and probably <laughs> the others as well. And um, I just can only imagine what a two day conference on this topic uh, yeah. being the one we originally organized and really hope that uh transnational actual travel <laughs> will be possible eventually so that we can continue what clearly is uh, an important topic conversation i am uh, really uh, grateful and amazed at the, the multiplicity of levels that we were able to bring in today material culture websites um uh, critical reflections it's poetry and storytelling with a historical perspective this was really rich and so I'm, I'm very grateful to um, Tiziana, to Claudia and mostly also to Caterina for uh, organizing this with me and going through all the steps in readjusting uh, the format. I want to share uh, one, like the desire expressed in one of the comments, how nice it would be to continue this discussion over a glass of wine. Yes, so true. <laughs> And uh, final remark, uh, there is a lot of work going on in translation and feminist studies jointly right now. So I put in the chat the um, name of this very useful um, mailing list, Feminist Translation Studies, that, uh, in which Olga Castro, who was mentioned before, has a major role. And unfortunately, she had to leave uh, 
earlier, but she was with us for a while. So that could be also like I just want to advertise that as a further point of reference for this conversation that we are uh, developing. And thanks everyone for uh, taking part in this really uh, amazing uh, discussion. So thanks again and have a good evening wherever you are.